Chapter 13, Ethics and Mediation. Ethics and Mediation. Vince Dooley, an Auburn University football coach, says, keep the rules to a minimum and enforce the ones you have. Keep the rules to a minimum, but enforce the ones you have. You know, th this, this happens all the time in, in uh, states. We have this in the state legislature every year where, well, ours meets every other year, but every other year when they meet, they say, well, let's come up with more rules. Let's come up with more things to enforce to control some aspect. You know, every state had these uh, gun control laws. And so they say, well, let's have more laws to control the use of guns. Well, how about more laws to, to control the use of the people who use the guns? But, you know, if they would just enforce the laws that are on the books, and this is what we're talking about. So the rules of ethics are, are really pretty simple. The rules of ethics and mediation are very simple. They're very to the point. Uh, and there's a... There's an old friend of mine, and uh, she, she's, a, she's a lawyer. Her, her husband was a judge, and, and, and he passed away from, uh, uh, he had a, uh, uh, a brain tumor and passed away at an early age. Uh, but she came up, her name is Lexa Ald, and she came up with, with what I consider a, a very good uh, uh, basis for, for your ethics for mediators. She calls it the Ten Commandments of Mediators. The Ten Commandments of Mediators. And these Ten Commandments of Mediators, the first commandment is, Thou shalt remain neutral, disinterested, unbiased, and without prejudice during the mediation process, and shall excuse thyself from the mediation if this is not possible. I mean, that's pretty clear and to the point. You know, you shall remain neutral, disinterested, unbiased, and without prejudice, during the mediation process and shall excuse thyself from the mediation if this is not possible. The second commandment, thou shalt not impose thy own opinions upon the participants to the mediation, but shall always remain open and receptive to the ideas of the parties and their attorneys. You know, she's, she has a lawyer, so she slipped that attorney thing in there. But, uh, you know, the, they, thou shalt not impose thy own opinions upon the participants to the mediation. Third commandment, thou shalt maintain the confidentiality of the mediation and respect the privacy of the participants. Thou shalt maintain the confidentiality of the mediation and respect the privacy of the participants. Number four, thou shalt conduct thyself in a professional manner with respect to demeanor, language, appearance, and treatment of parties during the course of the mediation. The fifth commandment is thou shalt follow the rules, policies, and procedures of the mediation service or program you represent. Now, obviously, if you have your own business, you represent your own program. And shall not attempt to further thy own personal goals or purposes while serving as a mediator. Okay? What does that mean to you all? You will not further your own purposes or goals as a mediator during this session. What does that mean to you all? What does that mean to you? Dennis? You're supposed to further the party's goals or let them come to an agreement and not have your own agenda. Okay. okay. And what I interpret this to mean is that, you know, during the mediation session or even after the mediation session, you know, don't be handing out your business cards. Don't be trying to further your own interest. Don't be trying to get more business from this situation that's got these folks in front of you. Okay. Now, obviously, they were referred to you or you were selected for some reason. You know, let that stand on its own, own merit, you know. Uh, and, the, you know, if they ask you for a card for how to contact you, that's different. That's totally different. But you can't be self-promoting. Commandment six, thou shalt remain open-minded, do not pass judgment, assess guilt, or assign fault to the parties or their attorneys involved in the mediation. Okay? Seventh commandment is thou shalt not offer unsolicited opinions or advice, whether it be legal, personal, or otherwise, in the participation of the mediation. 
the eighth commandment, thou shalt use thy common sense, think before you speak, consider the impact of what you are about to say or do. Many times mediators don't think about this, you know, they just blurt something out. They don't think about, okay, if I ask this question, how might they respond to that? How might they react to that question? So you need to constantly be thinking about not only what you're going to say, but the impact of what you're saying is going to have on the participants. Number nine, if working with a co-mediator, thou shalt work with and not against them. Okay? Well, that means a lot of things. That means, you know, don't criticize your co-mediator in front of the other parties. If your co-mediator is doing something that you don't approve of, you know, take a break. Get your co-mediator in private. Ask them what the particular situation is and maybe gently remind them about what you think it is that they're doing that's inappropriate, okay, or that you don't agree with. But you don't want to belittle or create conflict. Once again, remember the prime directive is, is you don't want to... Uh, create additional conflict. That not only doesn't mean with the other parties, but it also means with your co-mediator. Okay? It means you're not going to create additional conflict with in the mediation process. And the last one, number 10, commandment 10, thou shalt recognize that our judicial and legal systems are probably here to stay and therefore work within them as a mediator rather than rebelling against them. Okay? So we need to work within the system as opposed to rebelling against them. And those are, once again, from Lexa All, the Ten Commandments for, for Mediators. Uh, every state has a code of ethics when we're talking about dealing with confidential issues or whether we're dealing with whatever environment. Uh, in Texas, we have, uh, we have multiple sources to use for, to come up with a, a code of ethics. Um, and there's the code of ethics that I have in your manual, so there's no sense in me reading that verbatim because you can read that as simply as I can. But it's a compilation of different organizations. If you look at every s different set of ethics that are out there, they pretty much cover the 10 things that Lexa has talked about here. They talk about confidentiality. They talk about privacy. They talk about being neutral. They talk about working within the process. You know, those, those 10 basic points. Does anybody have any questions about, about ethics? Now, let me touch on something else about ethics that uh, is talking about conflict of interest. Uh, this is this is always a, an ethical ethical question. It shouldn't be a dilemma. It'll only be a dilemma if you allow it to be to, to get to this stage. Uh, the conflict of interest, and I'm on chapter 13.6. This conflict of interest, a mediator shall disclose any current, past, or possible future relations with anyone involved in the mediation. Disclosure shall be made as soon as practical after the mediator becomes aware of such relationship. After this disclosure, the parties may decide if the mediator can continue, okay? The only time this has ever happened, now I've had to disclose several times. Uh, many times you have the same lawyers that are representing clients in a mediation session, and I always bring it up at the beginning. I say, well, you know, I've said uh, this is like the fifth or sixth or dozenth time that you've been a lawyer representing someone in mediation, and the lawyer will typically will typically say something like, well, you know, I, I really believe in the mediation process and, and so that's why I keep bringing clients here. Well, that's not a relationship that you have with this lawyer, okay? So that's something that shouldn't create a conflict. But because it has been a relationship in the past, you need to disclose it. You need to make it aware. So that at some later point in that mediation, that lawyer doesn't say, well, that's not how you asked that question in the last mediation that we were in. And so then the other side says, wait a second, you've been in a mediation together with this guy before? Well, now that may op open up a can of worms. That's an unnecessary uh, conflict to, to bring out at that particular time. So disclose it up front, okay? If you just have a casual 
casual relationship. Uh, for example, let's say that uh, uh, I may recognize someone from, uh, uh, let's say I recognize Layla. I said, you know, Layla, you look familiar to me. And of course, she's heard this as a pickup line lots of times. But, you know, I might say, she says, oh, yeah, I've seen you. Uh, our kids play uh, in the same softball league. Okay, well, you know, we know of each other. We don't know each other. Uh, and so we just disclose that. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a harmless, it's something that just needs to be disclosed. Okay? Uh, the, one, the only instance where there was a situation where I had to, well, I thought where there might be some concern was in a case involved where it was a multifamily property uh, in the mediation. And as my role as a HUD supervisor, we had come down with a civil penalty against this, uh, this property management company. And of course, when you show up to do these volunteer mediations, you don't have a clue as to who you're, who you're mediating with. And so I show up and I get my little information sheet and it says XYZ property management company versus the Smiths. And so I say, well, wait a second, XYZ, why does that seem familiar? And then I see the parties, and I recognize one of them, and I say, oh, yes. Say, so then I have to disclose that. Well, remember, I'm the HUD person. They said, oh, yeah, we know. And we felt that you were fair there, so we don't have any problem with you handling this mediation. And the other side, well, they're thinking, oh, well, he nailed him as a HUD guy, so we're going to let him do this. You know, we think he's going to. So anyway, I disclosed that information to them, so they were, very, so they were aware of it. Uh, and if they didn't want me to mediate, well, if that's fine. They could have swapped me out with a... One of the advantages of doing these volunteer mediations is there's other mediations going on or about to start at the same time. And so it's easy to move you around to another mediation at the beginning than it is midway through a mediation. So that's why you do all these disclosures up front. Okay. Another potential conflict would be uh, if it is determined that the mediator has a vested interest or has an interest in the outcome of the mediation. If the mediator is going to reap a benefit, okay? That's why you can't advertise or promote that, well, you know, we charge $500 for mediation, but only $250 if we don't get it resolved, okay? The results of the mediation cannot be based, your fee cannot be based upon whether you're successful in the mediation or not. Okay, does that make sense? Does anybody have any, any questions or doubts about that? Your fee is what your fee is, and it cannot be altered based upon results. Okay? Now, while we're still talking about that is, if you're doing this for pay, you want to make sure that you're paid ahead of time so that there is no, so that you don't have anything hanging over your head before this mediation starts. You want to have that little issue behind you. Okay? Because what if they haven't paid, and they'll say, well, we'll just write you a check when this is over, and you don't get it resolved, and they say, well, this was a big waste of time. I didn't benefit from this mediation. And so then they, so what are you going to do? You're going to call the police? No, because they'll just laugh and laugh and laugh. And especially Byron gets the call, and he says, did you take Dr. Lacefield's class, and didn't he tell you to get paid before this started? Uh, and the last one, which we, we've already touched on, is the mediator will not use their role as a mediator to solicit, encourage future professional services from either party. Okay? And that's ethics. And if you, pretty much my general rule for ethics is, if, if, you, if it feels wrong, you think it feels wrong, then, then don't do it. It probably is wrong. Okay? If you have any doubts, then just then don't. Then don't. Yes, sir? Has anyone ever asked you what you do for a living outside of the mediation? Obviously, you have your own firm. Yes. But if someone's doing it on a part-time, has anyone ever asked you, well, what do you do for a living? I don't ever disclose that on the front end because it's really irrelevant. Lots of times I'll ask people. I mean, people will, will ask me if I'm a lawyer. And I'll say, well, Regardless of what, my, what I do outside of here, today I'm a mediator, okay? And then I'll kind of turn my head sideways and, you know, you think I'm a lawyer? No. So, you know, kind of like I'm hurt. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. Uh, but if they ask me when it's over with, you know, I'll say, well, yeah, I, I do this as a volunteer. I do this for pay, whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, I'll let them know. 
but because I don't want whatever my profession is to be pulled into this because once you tell them you're a police officer then they're going to say well you know the law they can't do that can they and as a matter of fact he's got 36 marijuana plants growing out there and I know where he's got it hidden in his car okay so you know they they'll that'll end up putting you in a bad position yes sir if you are a lawyer should you have this on your your law court then you know, a lawyer slash mediator sure absolutely there's nothing wrong with that because um, first of all that's permit because that's what you do that's that's your job that's your your income sure but once again you shouldn't be in the mediation session you shouldn't be soliciting business if they ask you for your business card well then give it to them but don't just give them their business card without the, without first them asking because if they ask for it you give it to them that's not solicitation right Back to Byron. <laughs> Sorry, Byron. If someone did reveal something about drugs, even though it's confidential, he also is sworn as a police officer to uphold the law. So wouldn't that be a conflict of interest there? Okay. See. Byron is not a police officer when he's a mediator. Okay, for that block of time that he's playing mediator, he's not a judge, he's not a prosecutor, he's not a police officer, he's not an attorney. He's not a CPA, okay? Have you read the new rules that have come out since this Enron thing about what CPAs are required to report if they uncover or if they find out or they know about? If, if they find out or they know about uh, improprieties within a company? You know, it's almost like the reporting that you have to do if, under, if, you're, uh, if you see child abuse. This is an SEC rule, okay? But in the role of a mediator, no, they're not a CPA, they're not a police officer, they're not, they're, they are not an officer of the court during that period of time and, and not have to report anything other than by law what we've already discussed that they would have to report. Now, if Byron knows these people, know where they live, there might be, you know, he might have cause to drive that neighborhood later on or something like that. I don't know that Byron would do that. His hands are probably pretty full with the domestic violence stuff. But... Um, be a can of worms. It would be a can of worms, right. So un unless someone's life is in jeopardy, unless it's child abuse, elderly abuse, or stalking in Texas, then, you know, you just kind of have to overlook it. So, you know, another reason not to tell them what you do.